for that kind introduction and thank you to the organizers for having me uh, here today. Uh, let me warn you, uh, trigger warning, this is going to be controversial. So, uh, you know, please uh, hold your uh, breath. And uh, also, I think uh, it's going to be, I think the most important thing for our future practice, right? So a lot of uh, ideas I'm going to throw around, uh, you know, uh, some of them are uh, may be sounding out of the world, but uh, please bear with me. So the question is, will a machine take over medical practice, fears, myths, and promised land? Will a machine take over medical practice? Answer is yes, right? This is not a debate. It is going to happen, right? The question is not will, the question is when. That's the important question, right? Uh, it's going to happen uh, sooner. You know, we, are, we all talk about driverless cars. It's going to happen, okay? But it's not, you know, whether it's going to happen in 2024 or 2034. That's the only question. So we are asked to have this multiple choice question. So let me just put this as a scenario. So you have a medical AI system designed to assist cardiac diseases. It's these, these things are going to be just lurking in the future, right? Uh, so you have this which AI system which diagnoses patients ECG medical history and gives a diagnosis of myocardial infarction and cardiologist is reviewing the AI conclusion. So there's a concept called, we'll discuss this concept, human in the loop model, which is, you know, so if you are going to with this concept, what is the most appropriate next step for the cardiologist? Should you accept the AI's diagnosis without further evaluation? Should he manually review the patient's ECG and medical history and validate using the AI diagnosis? Should he delegate the decision to a AI, another AI system for second opinion? Or should he disregard AI's diagnosis and give a second opinion just on his own diagnosis, right? So this is the human in loop model. Let me tell you another second MCQ, and this, this is a clear scenario which you'll see, actually see. So you have a pediatric clinic where you have an artificial general intelligence system, which is used to diagnose and recommend treatment for children with various illness. So you have a young child coming with symptoms that are consistent according to the AGI with a common cold. Now the child's mother expresses deep concern, mentioning that there are subtle changes in the child's behavior, which she has noticed, not noticed others. It's a mother's intuition, okay? So the attending physician or pediatrician senses the mother's anxiety and using understanding of the parent paternal instincts decides to do a more further investigation and leads to a more serious condition which AGI did not identify. So in this scenario, what influenced the patient's, the physician's or pediatrician's discretion? Was it the physician's reliance on AGI, the physician's recognition of mother's instinct and emotional insight? Was it AGI's inability to access the diagnosis? Or was it the hospital policy always to double check with the AGI diagnosis, right? These are MCQs. Just ideas that you put in your brain, right? Also, there are other important questions to ask. Can we stop our AI from really doing what it should? Should we stop it? And how is it going to impact you as a doctor? That's the most important question, right? So we'll try and answer this, all of these, right? Let me show you some examples. Again, I'm not saying these are going to replace your practice or these are going to you know, replace you as clinicians. I'm just putting ideas in your brain. So, uh, you know, for, as a preparatory to this talk, we actually made this little model uh, for, uh, you know, using chat GPT. Okay. So chat GPT as a customized GPT model, it's a virtual obesity expert. Okay. You might may or may not be able to read the entire script here. So what it's doing is when it gives you a welcome message, right, then asks the patient for the vital parameters, the height of the patient, the weight of the patient, it will calculate the BMI. It will also ask you for the ethnicity. It will say that you are an Indian. Right, so based on your ethnicity, it will you know calculate the uh, category where you fall in terms of the weight and overweight, and then you can go further. You can say what are the things I can do to uh, lose my weight. You know uh, what are the other things I can do. Right, for example, you can say I'm a 39 year old man with a sedentary lifestyle. Uh, the only thing I do is attend conferences. So what should I do to lose one kg a month? Right, so it'll give you a dietary recommendation and so on and so forth. Right, you can actually try this out. Uh, you'll need a Chat GPT Plus subscription. Uh, uh, and you'll be paying some money to uh, Sam Altman, but you can try it out, right? So this, uh, you know, using the link, okay? Now we have this another one which we made for RSSDI conference, which is a virtual dietitian. This is freely available. You can try this out as well. Well, go home, try it out, say, you know, uh, today I am in Chennai for a conference and I need to have a 1600 kilocalorie vegetarian diet. What should be my, you know, recommendations? So it will give you a recommendation for the whole day. There are more cases, right? In fact, we tried this out. Uh, uh, you know, our endocrine fellow, uh, she tried this out. Uh, so this is a real patient, 16 year old patient with recurrent fractures with trivial trauma presented to the emergency with lower limb weakness on assessment at hypokalemia, metabolic acidosis and normal anion gap. What is the likely diagnosis? It's a very straightforward thing, right? So she put this clinical history. This is a real patient, put the clinical history. I'll tell you, uh, this patient had seen 
and senior endocrinologists earlier who had missed the diagnosis, right? Which is the interesting part. So we put this into the endo AI, which uh, unfortunately is currently under maintenance. So don't try this out, but I'll just put this, we put this diagnosis uh, in the endo AI system, right? Uh, quickly, and this is a whole case scenario. It is assessing the answer, and within seconds, it will tell you the likely diagnosis is distal renal tubular acidosis. Trust me, this diagnosis is actually missed by endocrinologists, right? With the AF exam. So again, the question is not whether it's going to take your practice over. The question is when is it going to take your practice over, okay? Also, uh, as an assistance to what we do in clinical practice, a lot of the times we are looking at clinical research, right? So we are looking at evidence for research, right? So there's a uh, AI model already available. These are things which are already available today. I'm not talking about future. I'm not talking about Tesla, right? I'm not talking about driverless car. I'm talking about things available today as of 2024, okay? So this is consensus AI, right? One of the questions we often debate with our, you know, cardiologist colleagues, uh, is aspirin really useful for primary prevention? Now we have a lot of new data. So we put this to consensus AI and it gives us a beautiful recommendation of list of articles that I need to look at in terms of my assessment. So it's not giving me spoon feeding an idea to me. It's giving me a couple of re recommendations which I could read, right? And then I can select the article, probably ask for a summary of the article, which makes my job very easy, right? So these are some of the things which you can do, right? So will a machine take over medical practice? Let's back to the question. Answer is yes. We cannot do anything about it. You cannot stop scientific progress. Please remember this. A lot of people have tried, yet we are here today right? Flying from thousands of kilometers, listening to this talk, which is also being broadcast online, right? A lot of people are hearing this online, right? Could we stop this? No. In fact, COVID, COVID pushed this further, right? We are, we are in this world where, also let me tell you, it is for the good, right? It is for the good, for the greater good of humanity. And takeover doesn't mean it will replace us. And that's a very important thing, right? This is an important distinction. It means it will change our role and our function. Okay? So gone are the times where uh, a cardiologist had to be an expert in op listening to the opening snap. Now a cardiologist has to be an expert in interpreting and making a good echocardiography diagnosis. That's the role, right? The role has changed, right? The cardiologist now probably has lost his auscultation skills, but has acquired echocardiography skills, which is what really we need to do. We need to adapt. And that is what is really uh, important, right? So here are my arguments. The first argument, which will make you future proof, is that while we have, you know, workshops and there's, we are having a workshop on 18th on AI, right? If you're interested. Uh, but while we do workshops on AI and while we talk about AI, on the other end, we also need to look at completely the opposite end of it. And we need to be more better at being human because this is another skill which is going to take you forward in your life in the world of AI, right? So let me tell you this uh, argument further. Now, what I believe is that 1800s, was a time when medicine was an art, right? It was part of humanity, right? Medicine meant that, you know, you need to be a soothing person. And I take a lot of inspiration from Dr. Uh, Shankar, uh, Dr. Mahadevan's lecture last uh, few weeks back, right? So, uh, you know, a uh, uh, few inspiration from there, right? And then you move to the era, which was medicine as a science, right? Currently, you know, we are still in that era, right? We're talking about RCTs and we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, chemicals and we're talking about pharmaceuticals and medicine as a science. but now, the current era, medicine is mathematics, okay? What you're looking at is algorithms. What you're looking at is numbers, right? You've seen how it is evolved. You know, in clinical practice, we just the lecture before, we talked about, you know, when you take a critical sample, what's the value? Sugar is less than 50. What's the C-peptide value? What's the, you know, uh, insulin value? You're actually talking numbers, right? We are changing to mathematics of insulin, uh, math mathematics of, of medicine, right? But the point is, when you have mathematics, it's very difficult for people to understand math you actually require a human to interpret that math for you, right? And that is where we are coming the whole circle. And again, being human is something, is a skill which your patients are really going to appreciate and your patients is really going to like, right? You all talk about, you know, you, uh, you have food available with Swiggy and Zomato, right? Uh, my, my daughter, the other said, I don't want Domino's pizza. I want pizza from that restaurant, which is handmade by the chef, right? This is how they advertise it, right? So we are looking at things which are more personal, which are more human. So we are coming to the whole circle and doctors now, we need to be better at being what we are, that is human beings, right? So the skill set that is really going to take us apart is empathy, discretion, and the power to convince your patients, right? Power to talk to them, look into their eye and tell them that, look, you need to get admitted because you have recurrent hypoglycemia, right? That's the point, okay? So 
Hence, we have the model and which I talked about, the model which is really going to work for AI and for humanity as a whole is what is known as a human in loop model. So you have the AI which generates, which takes inputs, generates an output, the human confirms, rejects or labels it, but then very importantly, the human delivers that information, right? Remember, when you talk in the world of, uh, you know, uh, law, right, you will often have a trial lawyer and there's a lawyer who is doing research. There's a guy sitting behind a paralegal probably who is doing, who is good at doing research, who is good at doing legal research, but there's a guy who front stands in front of the judge and puts his argument forward, right? That's a trial lawyer, right? And that's a trial lawyer who gets all the money and all the fame, right? Because he's connecting with another human being and that's the one which is really, really key skill, which is important. So my first important take home message is while you invest in learning new technology, please do that, right? But also invest in being a better human being. That's a very important skill that is going to take you forward. Second is machines can never understand humans because humans are flawed. We are flawed. It's our problem, right? So that's the problem with humans. And the argument here is, in India, we have the best of medical care available. We have best best of technology. We are best of doctors, right? All of you are sitting here. However, you know, do we always use it? Do our always patients always use the best of medical care available to them? They don't, right? They don't. Why? Right? Machines will never understand this, right? Because as human beings, we are flawed, right? Let me give an example. So you have this patient, recent patient comes to me in the OPD with type 2 diabetes, but had osmotic symptoms. HP1C was 11, RBS was 498, right? What is the treatment which AI will propose, right? So you can, you know, try it our our, our diabetology.co.in. This is RSSDI sponsored research, okay? We are going to present our data in the RSSDI research institute. You put in your data and uh, it will tell you uh, here, right? Does the patient need insulin? Answer is yes, right? So it will say patient has osmotic symptoms, uh, you know, uh, uh, patient has, uh, you know, HbA1c of 11. Uh, does the patient need insulin? Yes, the patient will need insulin. Yet, and, uh, you know, Dr. Chawla will agree with me, right? When you have this patient coming to your OPD, he's going to refuse insulin, right? Why? We have the best treatment available. It's not that patient cannot afford it, right? That AI tells you that you have the best treatment available. Yet, the patient can refuse it, right? Because there's no human being talking, right? Now, Think about this, you know, the patient goes to an AI machine and AI doctor puts in the data, AI says, you need insulin, right? Patient says, I don't want to take it, right? What are going to, what is he going to do? Who is he going to argue with, right? You all have that frustration when you're talking about, you know, uh, that, that customer calls where you have to punch one number and two number and three number. You just want to talk to somebody, right? I just want to rant out that my flight is canceled, solve my problem, right? You don't want really that one number and two number to really put, right? So the problem is human beings are flawed, right? And we need another human being to remove that flaw, right? It's always that parent, that mother, that that spouse will say that, yeah, you know, listen to your doctor. He's right, right? You need insulin, and then he's going to be convinced, right? So only under humans can understand the flaws of other human beings, which is the thing, right? And the third argument, and this is my final argument, which is very, very essential. You all talk about iceberg phenomena, right? That you have X number of diabetic patients that we see, but there are 100 X number of diabetes patients that we don't see in clinical practice. We all say, Always, you know, any talk I go and give, it's always iceberg, right? We are just seeing tip of iceberg. Now, who is going to melt that iceberg? Who is going to see the entire, you know, uh, picture of, of uh, uh, the entire iceberg, entire ice, right? Let me ask you this twist. We all talk about three important, I will say, people in the field of endocrine. So you have the, you have Benting and Best, you have Fuller, Albright, right? A lot of conditions are named after Albright, right? Just, just try, think about it. And then you use it in uh, Rosalind uh, Yalo. Right, all three, uh, except Albright did not get a uh, Nobel Prize, but the other did, right? Who is the most important? I'll say Rosalind. Why? Because she discovered a way of measuring things which we could not measure earlier. The entire field of endocrinology completely changed after this, right? Look at us today. We are interpreting reports, right? How are we doing this? Because of her, not because of Benting and Best, right? They, their, import, their contribution is important, not because of Fuller Albright, who discovered a lot of things, yet a lot of things could not be measured, right? If you can measure it, you can manage it, right? What is changing is measurability. And how will AI work in this regard? What it will do is it will make early diagnosis, right? With interpretation of context that you are able to, that you are often missing in your practice, the AI will be able to pick it up, right? That will lead to early referral. Early referral will lead to early treatment, better treatment, and ultimately to better outcome. And that is why I'm saying it's actually good. Right, a lot of these patients, you know, a patient walks in, puts in his data. Even today, you don't need to go to, you know, just put in your data. You know, my weight is this, my height is this, my I have a family history of diabetes mellitus, I have a family history of this and that. 
right? Put in the data. Should I be screened for diabetes mellitus? Let's say a 25-year-old goes and puts this. And the AI says, yes, you need a screening for diabetes. He goes, gets him checked. His HPNC is 7.1, starts treatment early. You all know the outcome of that, right? So the idea is early treatment, right? Uh, just the other day, we had this patient who, you know, went for a routine screening, right? A uh, young patient went, goes for a routine screening, turns out to have a lesion in the uh, kidney, right? Which turns out to be malignancy, which turns out to be isolated. It, it was, you know, localized, it did not metastatized, which led to a good surgical outcome, which led to the remission, right? Which is good, right? End of the day, you're picking up diagnosis much earlier. It's always good, right? So I think in a sense, it is going to really help us. So I think before we become partially irrelevant to the world, a lot of these, you know, the bottoms of the iceberg are really going to be revealed to you. Your work for the next decade is actually you're going to be more busy than you ever were, right? Yes, there'll be a lot of pages of reports that you'll have to sit and read, right? Like, you know, I'll not name the company, but you know, you have this booklet of reports, right? You're going to have that, but you're going to pick up diagnosis much earlier than you used to, right? And that is where AI is going to be very useful to you. So my closing arguments is this, right? Will machine take over medical practice? Answer is it will. Again, I'm saying the question is not where will, the question is when, right? It's going to happen. But does this mean will doctors become irrelevant? No. Only our role, our, our designation, our work, our field is going to change. Will our patients be lost to us? No. There will be, in fact, an increasing number of patients. You'll be able to cater to more patients earlier with a better outcome, right? And what skills you should focus on? I think there are two diametrically opposite skills you should focus on. You should focus on trying to understand what AI is and what it's doing. Also, you need to learn better to communicate with your patients again. You need to touch base. You need to be better human beings, right? So the point being that you need to now learn to communicate with your patients, with human beings, and learn to communicate with the machine. I think these are the two skills which are extremely essential and important, right? So coming to the answers to the multiple choice question, the question one was you had this ECG system which was there. Uh, quintessentially, most of the AI systems that are built across the world have this human in loop model, right? So radiologists will not become irrelevant. What will happen is radiologists will be said, okay, look, you have a, uh, you know, you did an ultrasound where you have a TIRADS 3 lesion. Do you confirm? The radiologist will say yes or no. It will, in fact, enhance his diagnosis, right? So this is the human in loop model. So remember, you all have ECG AI diagnosis, right? But you don't just rely on the diagnosis. You are relying on your clinical judgment based on that, right? And the second multiple choice question we asked was, the importance of AGI, you know, here the AGI made a diagnosis, said that the child is having common cold based on the parameter it was told. But there's a maternal instinct there which said that patient has something, the child has something more, right? The mother knew the child, the AI didn't, right? So at the end of the day, the important point is, again, we need to look at this, some of the subtle things which cannot be captured by data, right? That are instincts. And these instincts are something which is really going to help us as doctors. And I think we need to sharpen these instincts to really be a better doctor, right? So a physician's recognition of the mother's instincts and emotional insight really help make a better diagnosis for the child, right? So uh, we are coming up with this book very soon, uh, Six Healthcare Trends for the Future, right? The idea is to recognize six very important things that we are going to see as a matter of change in terms of the uh, healthcare. So, you know, watch out this space. We, this book is uh, we are about to release maybe a couple of months down the line. Thank you for a patient listening. And this is a WhatsApp group. Uh, WhatsApp channel for endocrinology and technology. If you're interested, most welcome for that. Thank you.